Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm excited for our final study in the Song of Solomon with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We're going to cover a lot of scripture, and Dr. McGee has plenty of wisdom to share from God's Word, so let's get started with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're here with willing hearts. Would you help us to hear your voice in these words from Solomon, and then stir faith in our friends who are listening, but who don't yet know you? Help them to understand their need for salvation, Lord, and then open their hearts to accept your great love for us, expressed through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're off to the Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come to our last study in the Song of Solomon, we're really back in Chapter 5 at verse 10. Now, we went through this last time and read it. And this is a bit of antiphony, this song here is. This, by the way, is the fifth song, and it, in one sense, is the most important, and it is the longest one of all. And it begins with an antiphony of the bride who was seeking for the bridegroom, and he'd withdrawn. She went out looking for him, and she met the daughters of Jerusalem, and she inquired of him. And they are rather cynical and skeptical. They say to her, who is he? (laughs) Why do you think he's so great? Why don't you forget him and get someone else? And after all, they're all alike. She says, they're not all alike. My beloved is white and ruddy. He's the chiefest among 10,000. There's not one in 10,000 that can equal him at all. Then she begins to describe him in utmost detail. And two things were very evident. One is that she knew him. And we must know Christ if we are to witness for him and to him. We must know him. We must know him intimately. Not only know him, we must love him. The bride loved him. She could speak with enthusiasm. When you come to Christ, it's not a business transaction. He's wonderful today. I don't think that we laud him and glorify him and lift him up and worship him and bow in thanksgiving before him enough. He's wonderful any way you look at him. And I was reading last time from Dr. Schofield's little tract, The Loveliness of Christ. And I want to pick up there another section of that little tract. And it says this, The saintliness of of Jesus is so warm and human that it attracts and inspires. We find in it nothing austere or inaccessible like a statue in a niche. The beauty of his holiness reminds one rather of a rose or a bank of violets. And he is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. I just put that in. Now I'm reading. Jesus receives sinners and eats with them, all kinds of sinners, Nicodemus the moral religious sinner, and Mary of Magdala, out of whom went seven demons, the shocking kind of sinner. He comes into the sinful life as a bright, clear stream enters a stagnant pool. The stream is not afraid of contamination, but its sweet energy cleanses the pool. I remark again, and as connected with this, that his sympathy is altogether lovely. He is always being touched with compassion. The multitude without a shepherd, the sorrowing widow of Nain, the little dead child of the ruler, the demonic of Gadara, the hungry 5,000, whatever suffers touches Jesus. His very wrath against the scribes and Pharisees is but the excess of his sympathy for those who suffer under their hard self-righteousness. Did you ever find Jesus looking for deserving poor? He healed all their sick. And what grace in his sympathy. Why did he touch that poor leper? He could have healed him with a word as he did the nobleman's son. Why for years the wretch had been an outcast, cut off from kin, dehumanized. He lost the sense of being a man. It was defilement to approach him. 
Well, the touch of Jesus made him human again, as well as healed him. A Christian woman laboring among the moral lepers of London found a poor street girl desperately ill in a bare, cold room. With her own hands, she ministered to her, changing her bed linen, procuring medicines, nourishing food, a fire, and making the poor place as bright and cheery as possible. And then she said, May I pray with you? No, said the girl, you don't care for me. You are doing this to get to heaven. Many days passed, and the Christian woman, unwearily kind, the sinful girl hard and bitter. At last the Christian said, My dear, you are nearly well now, and I shall not come again. But as it is my last visit, I want you to let me kiss you. And the pure lips that had known only prayers and holy words met the lips defiled by oaths and by unholy caresses. And then, my friends, the hard heart broke. That was Christ's way. May I say to you, as I've read this, May I say to you, this little book opened, did it not, with that very beautiful statement, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. May I say to you, he wants today to bestow his love, his affection, his care, his grace, and his mercy upon you. <laughs> and we are as hard as that poor sinning girl was. And then will you notice something else? That's in this little tract. Can you fancy him calling a convention of the Pharisees to discuss methods of reaching the masses? That leads me to remark that his humility was altogether lovely. And he, the only one who ever had the choice of how and where he should be born, he entered this life as one of the masses. What meekness, what lowliness. I am among you as one that serveth. He began to wash his disciples' feet. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Can you think of Jesus posing and demanding his rights? But it is in his way with sinners that the supreme loveliness of Christ is most sweetly shown. How gentle he is, yet how faithful. How considerate, how respectful. Nicodemus, candid and sincere, but proud of his position as a master in Israel, and timid lest he should imperil it, comes to Jesus by night. Before he departs, the master has learned his utter ignorance of the first step toward the kingdom and goes away to think over the personal application of they love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil but he has not heard one harsh word, one utterance that can wound his self-respect. When he speaks to the silent, despairing woman after her accusers have gone out one by one, he uses for woman the same word as he used when addressing his mother from the cross. Follow him to Jacob's well at high noon and hear his conversation with the woman of Samaria how patiently he unfolds the deepest truths, how gently, yet faithfully he presses the great ulcer of sin which is eating away her soul. But he could not be more respectful to Mary of Bethany. Even in the agonies of death, he could hear the cry of despairing faith. When conquerors return from far wars and strange lands, they bring their chiefest captives as a trophy. It was enough for Christ to take back to heaven the soul of a thief. Yea, he's altogether lovely, and now I've left myself no room to speak of his dignity, of his virile manliness, of his perfect courage. There is in Jesus a perfect equipoise of various perfections. All the elements of perfect character are in lovely balance. His gentleness is never weak. His courage is never brutal. My friend, you may study these things for yourself. Follow him through all the scenes of outrage and insult, 
on the night and morning of his arrest and trial, behold him before the high priest, before Pilate, before Herod, see him browbeaten, bullied, scourged, smitten upon the face, spit upon, mocked, how his inherent greatness comes out. Not once does he lose his self-poise, his high dignity. Let me ask some unsaved sinner here to follow him still farther. Go with the jeering crowd without the gates. See him stretched upon the great rough cross and hear the dreadful sound of the sledge as the spikes are forced through his hands and feet. See as the yelling mob falls back, the cross bearing this gentlest, sweetest, bravest, loveliest man, upreared until it falls into the socket in the ground, and sitting down they watched him there. You watch too. Hear him ask the Father to forgive his murderers, Hear all the cries from the cross. Is he not altogether lovely? What does it all mean? He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. To him all that believe are justified from all things. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I close with the word of personal testimony. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. Will you not accept him as your Savior and beloved and friend? And that's the end of the quotation, friends. And I want to add to it, amen. That means I agree with every word of it. My beloved is the chiefest among 10,000. He is the one that's altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And then just one more thing. Let me pass on to you. His birth was contrary to the laws of life. His death was contrary to the laws of death. He had no cornfields or fisheries, but he could spread a table for 5,000 and have bread and fish to spare. He walked on no beautiful carpets or velvet rugs, but he walked on the waters of the Sea of Galilee, and they supported him. When he died, few men mourned, but a black crepe was hung over the sun. The men trembled not for their sins. The earth beneath them shook under the load. All nature honored him. Sinners alone rejected him. Corruption could not get hold of his body. The soil that had been reddened with his blood could not claim his dust. Three years he preached his gospel. He wrote no book, built no church house, had no monetary backing. But after 1,900 years, he is the one central character of human history, the pivot around which the events of the ages revolve, and the only regenerator of the human race. Was it merely the son of Joseph and Mary who crossed the world's horizon 1,900 years ago? Was it merely human blood that was spilled on Calvary's hill for the redemption of sinners? What thinking man can keep from exclaiming, My Lord and my God, This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And she knew him. She loved him. And she makes him known. (laughs) That's important. Now in chapter 6, verse 1, we read, the question is asked. These that were skeptical at first and cynical, they now ask the question, Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fattest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? And they say, now we'll help you find him. (laughs) We want to see this one that you're telling about. We want to get a look at him ourselves. He must be wonderful. And the Lord Jesus said, the one that seeks is going to find. He that cometh to me I'll in no wise cast out. Now will you listen to the bride? This is her last word 
in this book. No, it's not the last word, but it's getting down close to the last word for her. She says, verse 2, My beloved has gone down to his garden to the bed of spices to feed in the garden and to gather lilies. She located him. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. What assurance, what satisfaction, what joy. God is satisfied with Jesus. He's satisfied with him. This is my beloved son, he says. Hear him. And he's satisfied what he did for us on the cross yonder. And he says that if you come to him, you will not perish You'll have everlasting life. What an invitation has gone out. He speaks of his bride now. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. And then down in verse 10, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? Now, that's the other side of the rapture of the church. You see, we always look at it from our side. Naturally, we would. And we say the Lord himself will come from heaven. A shout. The voice of the archangel, his voice. The trump of God, his voice will be like a trumpet. He's going to call his own. But the other side, when the church comes into his presence, I tell you, when... Those of the angelic hosts see that. It's going to be one of the greatest sights that eternity will ever behold when his church goes yonder to meet him. I think that's going to be one of the most thrilling events, and certainly it'll be for us. And you have a picture of it, of course, when this girl, Rebecca, you remember, came back to meet Isaac. And you have Isaac walking in the field then he looks out yonder, and there comes that camel caravan. And Rebecca on the camel, and she lights off the camel and comes to meet him. And what a picture. What a glorious picture that will be when you and I go into the presence of Christ someday. And now we find here, verse 11, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished, and the pomegranates budded. And I can't resist intruding this. I had a preacher friend that went in to speak to a bunch of unbelievers. They were actually, some of them college professors, really, but they're not as fruitcake as far as life is concerned. Their theories have them way out in left field. And I asked him about it. I said, what did you think you accomplished? He said, all I did, it was scriptural. He said, I went down into the garden of nuts. No question about that. Well, let's move on. Verse 13, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies. And he has made the statement that we are before the demonstration of his glory and his grace throughout all ages. That, you remember, is the thing we're told in Ephesians, the second chapter, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. All a created universe is going to see all of us, and none of us are worthy to be there, but we're going to be there. Why? Because he loved us and gave himself for us. How wonderful it's going to be. And we'll demonstrate the grace of God. We're there for his glory and for our good. May I say to you, I can't think of anything better than that. And now in chapter 7, you have this wonderful picture here that he gives of her. And then all she can say and all she needs say, verse 10, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. Oh, to know today that Christ belongs to us and that he wants to do us good. He says, come and we'll do you good. He wants to help you, friend. He doesn't want to hurt any of you. He wants to help you. And then here in chapter 8, we have this 
that is quite interesting. The bride says, we have a little sister. She hath no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? Well, who's going to speak for her? Well, may I say to you, nobody would warn her. We were outcasts. Well, he saved us, not because we were attractive, but because he saw our lost condition and he loved us. He'd created us. Now he wants to save us. How wonderful. What a picture. And that little sister, all these nations out here, we were part of it, by the way. And he wanted to get the word out to us. And now the bride here speaks and has the last word. She says in verse 14 now of chapter 8, Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. You remember she saw him there when he came back like that. And now she's saying, return. And this is the bride over here in the book of Revelation. The last thing she says is, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. My friend, you can't say that unless you know him, unless you love him, and unless you make him known. I don't think you can say that. Now, you can be saved, but you can't look up and say, come, Lord Jesus, I want you to come. Oh, my friend, give us that, that Paul said. He'll give a crown to those that love his appearing. And to love his appearing means to love him. This is a wonderful little book. We've only stood on the fringe of it. And I trust it's blessed our hearts. May God richly bless you, my beloved. We'll hear more from Dr. McGee in just a minute. But first, we'll continue our five-year journey through the whole Word of God next in the New Testament book of Colossians. To get your free notes and outlines for Colossians, you can download our digital book, Briefing the Bible, over at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And of course, ttb.org is also the place to download our new Bible companion for Colossians. Dr. McGee is going to close our study today with a few final thoughts on the Song of Solomon. Now, in this book, we have had very marvelous statements. The bridegroom says, There is no spot in thee. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now, you find that in the Song of Solomon in two places. Chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 7. And this is the estimation of, that the Lord Jesus has of the church today. What a picture of the bride down here. And I want you to note that because we have a statement by Spurgeon. I'd like for you to have this to take with you. It speaks of the bride down here now. And this, I think, is one of the most beautiful pictures of a bride, a wife in Uh, marriage relationship. I'm reading. She delights in her husband, in his person, his character, his affection. To her, he is not only the chief and foremost of mankind, but in her eyes, he's all in all. Her heart's love belongs to him and to him only. He is her little world, her paradise, her choice treasure. She's glad to sink her individuality in his, She seeks no renown for herself. His honor is reflected upon her, and she rejoices in it. She will defend his name with her dying breath. Safe enough is he where she can speak of him. His smiling gratitude is all the reward she seeks. Even in her dress she thinks of him and considers nothing beautiful which is distasteful to him. He has many objects in life, some of which she does not quite understand, but she believes in them all, and anything she can do to promote them, she delights to perform. Such a wife, as a true spouse, realizes the model marriage relation and sets forth what our oneness with the Lord ought to be. That's a glorious picture, by the way. I trust 
that it might have drawn you into a new relationship with Him. Jesus came in Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from His Word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.